Hello, and welcome to School to Homeschool. I am Janae Daniels. I'm a wife, a mother of six, and a former middle school teacher turned homeschool mom. I have kids in their 20s all the way down to elementary age and everything in between. Are you thinking about pulling your kids from the school system like I did, but you're scared to death and don't know what to do next? My friends, I felt the same way, and you have come to the right place. I want to help your family leave the system so that you can take the hearts and minds of your children back. Hello, my friends. Welcome back. Before we get into today's episode, which is a daunting one for me to talk about, uh, but I feel like it's really important to discuss, I want to tell you about uh, something that happened last week. I had the opportunity to go to uh, an entrepreneur conference that was four days long with my husband. He's the entrepreneur. I'm not really an entrepreneur. I want to pretend that I am, but I'm not. Uh, And so I went to this conference and one thing that I didn't expect when we bought the tickets to the conference was how many millionaires would be in the room with us. There was 5,000 people and there was an obscene amount of millionaires and multimillionaires in that room. Okay. So this is what surprised me, right? Cause I, we're kind of middle class. I mean, maybe some would consider us upper middle class. Um, I, I grew up very middle class, right? Eight kids in my family. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I always had hand me downs cause I was one of the youngest in the family. That was, that was my growing up. So I go to this conference and there's multimillionaires in the room and I I'm networking with people, right? And in my world in Colorado Springs, when I talk to people and you say you're homeschooling, you know, half the time people are like, oh, we, you know, that's, that's cool. It's becoming more normalized. But most of the time, as many of you know, it's like, oh, okay, well, are you going to put them in, in high school or what? You know, like people are just dumb. People are stupid. Um, but at this conference, I was expecting to get the same reaction when I'd start networking with people between breaks and at dinner time, early in the morning, I was anticipating, you know, people saying, well, what do you do? And I, you know, I, I run this podcast and I'm really passionate about helping families, um, that are transitioning from the public school system into homeschooling or even thinking about homeschooling. It's kind of become, I was expecting people to say, Oh, that's cute. Like I get all the time, like, Oh, that's good for you. You know? My friends, I was shocked because I met so many people at this conference, right? I met so, there was 5,000 people there. I was meeting people nonstop, people I was sitting next to, people that were sitting in front of me and behind me, you know, during the different sessions because it was, it was open seating. I was anticipating the same reaction, but that's not what happened. Instead, the reaction that I got was, oh, that's fantastic. We actually homeschool. And I'm like, what? And, and and of all of the people that I met, I met one mom who said, oh, I wish I would have homeschooled my kids. They're all adults. Uh, but we didn't, you know, we, we didn't. And back then it wasn't, you know, a thing. Uh, I had, I met two people whose kids are in private school, one of which the gentleman asked for my contact information because he and his wife want to homeschool and pull their kids from the, the, the private, pull them from private school because they have some neurodivergent kids, which we're going to talk about today. And they're really concerned about what they're learning as well as how they're being treated at the private school. And then everyone else, everyone else homeschooled their kids. Everyone else that I met to, did you hear that? Everyone else that I met there multimillionaires homeschool their kids. I, I was shocked when I got home, I started looking at things and uh, my, my husband shared with me some Instagram reels and some other things. And it was, there was this one reel in particular where a guy was like, I interview the, the upper echelon of you know, millionaires and billionaires and the top 1% of the 1%. And he said, they all homeschool their kids. There's a couple who, who put their kids in private school. Most of them bring in private tutors, private educators, or their spouses and them 
homeschool their kids and travel school with them and, and whatnot. Um, he goes, that's the reality. The reality is the upper echelon of society does not put their kids in public school. Right. So, which is blew my mind. And then I saw that legitimately when I was at this conference. So I was shocked. So what does that mean? Um, I don't know. I, I, it was like reaffirming because we, I'm, I'm, we're told, right. When, even though it's becoming more and more common for homeschooling, we're told like, oh, your kids are going to be stupid. Your kids are going to be this. Aren't you worried about them in high school? Aren't you worried about these things? But yet the ultra wealthy are homeschooling their kids. That actually hasn't changed since the 1800s, right? 1852, we get Horace Mann who introduces a centralized education system idea. Massachusetts is the first to adopt it. And Horace Mann, my friends, continued to homeschool his kids. He didn't send them to the system that he created in the United States. And that hasn't changed. It's the same. The upper echelon still homeschools their kids. But as middle class, we don't necessarily always hear that, right? We assume that they all send them to private school, and some of them do. But but the reality is a lot of them will pull in private tutors and uh, private teachers, or they'll do it themselves and and take them on adventures themselves. I was shocked. And that that conference reiterated that for me. So one other thing I want to share with you. So I just wanted to share that because I thought that was really fascinating. You're in good company, mamas. You're in good company with the upper echelon of society. And maybe some of you are in the upper echelon. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the other thing is um, next week we have a, my very first interview. We have a very special guest coming. I'm very excited to um, introduce you to him if you haven't already heard of him. He is a children's author and he'll be joining us to discuss um, some very cool things that uh, some work that he's been doing and how to introduce concepts to children such as uh, capitalism, American history, and things like that. So I'm not going to say who it is, but I'm very excited to have him on the program next week. So we've got some great interviews set up for you. So I'm very excited about that. So with that, let's go ahead and and get started. I actually want to start with a clip and I hope I don't get in trouble like with copywriting and things like that. But I want to share with you a clip uh, from The Simpsons to introduce the, today's today's podcast. So let me share this with you and hopefully you can hear it. Um, so here we go. I'm going to share this with you. This is come, comes from The Simpsons, which is not my favorite show. Okay. So if you can see this, if you're watching on YouTube, Hopefully you can hear it if you're not. Um, my little boy here we go. Okay, so I'm going to come back. So The Simpsons is not my favorite show, but sometimes it, it in a very harsh but funny way, tells the truth. Okay, so for those of you who are listening, essentially the clip, I'm just going to briefly explain the clip. The clip was uh, the the Simpsons parents, Marge and I can't remember. Again, I didn't, I'm not a big Simpsons watcher. So the parents go in, they're meeting with some, uh, some doctors and they're like, oh, look, you know, your child needs this focusum medication. And you see these little guinea pigs running around crazy. And then they give them, they spray them with the medication. And then they have, then the, the little hamster guinea pig things go and sit in a classroom and and then uh, they said, look, look, now they're, they're listening and they're like little slaves. Um, and then the, the end of the clip finishes with the only thing better than this is exercise. And Bart Simpson's dad is like, Ugh! right. So that's the clip. That's the clip for those that you couldn't see. Cause I see that it didn't record the audio portion. Um, okay. So I want to talk today about neurodivergent kids as well as twice exceptional kids. Those are the talented and gifted. And actually it goes beyond talented and gifted. Those that really could be beyond uh, two grade levels beyond what, what their age is. Um, now I come in very humbly talking about this. I know that many of you worry about your kids. I see it on Facebook all the time. I'm in all of those Facebook groups. I don't know what to do with my child with pu the public schools are not helping them, but I don't want to homeschool. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you should really homeschool, right? And people have their different reasons that they don't homeschool. I try not to be judgmental. Sometimes it's like, I want time to myself. I get that. You need respite. 
but these, but, but it's the sacrifice of some of these kids at times. So let me share with you, um, my, my personal story. And then I want to share some stories of other people as well as 504 accommodations. What's, what's going on in the school system, the IEP individual education plans, and, and what can be done when your child is neurodivergent? So what does that mean to be neurodivergent? So this is from the Child Mind Institute. It says neurodiversity refers to the idea that a kid's brain functions differently from those of neurotypical children. And it comes in many forms such as learning disorders, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, or sensory processing issues. While neurodivergent students may possess unique strengths such as exceptional memorization skills or hyper-focus abilities, they often require additional support from teachers, counselors, administrators and support staff in the school to excel academically and socially. Okay. I have six children. Now, as I've mentioned before, I've, those who've been on this podcast before know this. My, our second child was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. The pediatrician and the therapist said he is the poster child for ADHD, right? And so we put him on medications early on only to take him off medications uh, within a couple years. And I did what the professionals told me to do, even though it started feeling wrong. Um, so so that that's that child. Third child, twice exception. This is my first biological child. He is talented and gifted. Not only is he talented and gifted, but he is what's considered twice exceptional, meaning he's at, two, at least two grade levels academically above, um, uh, what his age is. Okay. So that's my third child, my fourth and fifth children, uh, both talented and gifted, not necessarily deemed as twice exceptional, still great kids, but they tend to be more neurotypical kids. And then my caboose, we get her as you know, she's my biological child as well. My last four biological uh, from the time that she is born has regular meltdowns beyond the scope of like a neurotypical child. And I noticed that in infancy, like things are not n- what we would call normal. Although I once heard a psychiatrist say normal is only sitting on a washing machine, right? Nobody's really normal, but she was definitely not typical of a, of a, a standard infant and, and I went to the pediatrician for many years about it, like up until the age of three, I kept saying, you know, doctor, there's, there's something going on with her and I don't know what to do because she would scream and hit herself and bite herself and pull her hair out and meltdowns with her would last several hours during the night. So I went for several years getting very minimal sleep with my last child, um, ultimately by the age of three years and a couple months, um, I kept begging, like, there's gotta be something. And the pediatrician kept telling me who I loved, you know, he was my husband's pediatrician, fabulous pediatrician helped us through all the other stuff with our other kids. But he kept saying, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. And I'm like, doctor, I'm telling you something is wrong with my child. And it wasn't until his, his nurse practitioner one day looked at her and she started to, she, she sat down and she sat in a little W shape and she started to go and have a meltdown that the nurse practitioner looked at her and went, I know what's going on with your child. Um, I'm going to refer you to have her tested for sensory processing disorder. We went to one clinic after the, you know, the battery of tests that they gave her after a few hours, they came back a week later and said, yeah, now she, she has sensory processing uh, didn't love that clinic. It was a local, a local clinic for us. I, I didn't love it. Didn't have a great experience there. And a friend of mine who's an occupational therapist said, you really should look at the star Institute in Denver, which is like the, the place to send your child if they have, um, sensory processing. It was expensive. It, we had to pay out of pocket for it. Insurance didn't cover it, but ultimately for three days a week, we went to the Star Institute. We, I would drive her up there and she would meet with the occupational therapist who I believe was a godsend and an angel. Her name was Mara. Mara, I still think you're an angel. Worked with her three days a week 
And, and we suddenly started seeing things change. It was inter- interesting. They explained to me how sensory processing works, how these children have, they feel different, how they process things is different. She needed more stimulation. Uh, at the time, the crazy thing is at the time, my daughter was in preschool and she would keep it together in preschool and then fall apart when she got home and just scream for hours. During this time, she's at, at, the, at the Star Institute and I, I went to the preschool teacher and said, look, this is, these are some of the things that my child needs. The preschool teacher, and it was a public preschool, the school that my kids went to, um, said, there's nothing wrong with your daughter. And I even had given her the reports from the two different clinics and she still denied it. It got so bad that I finally contacted the school district and said, L- listen, I want her tested for autism. I, so I went and and had to advocate for her. The psychologist, the school district psychologist, two occupational therapists, um, the uh, vice principal, the assistant principal, and the preschool staff, and my husband and I met in this large room to discuss her needs, and the preschool teacher still said, I'm sorry, there is nothing wrong with her. I reject all of what you're saying. And the, the assistant principal is like, you, you can't just reject what, what the psychologist is saying, the, you know, w- these reports are saying, you know, and it was kind of an uphill battle. And she honestly felt justified in her, her feelings, not wanting to accept or give accommodations because they were looking at giving her, my child an individual education plan as well, or 504 accommodations for her. And she said, well, I've got other students who are far worse than she's our, she's our model student in school. And I just, I just reject this, right. Which legally she can't do, but she tried until the assistant principal had to have a nice talk with her as well as the psychologist and all of the other specialists are like, no, 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 no. Um, so that (laughs) was awesome. That was an awesome experience for me. I know she tried her best. Ultimately then COVID hit halfway through the year and we finish up the year. And at that point I was scared to death because I thought how, you know, I, I predominantly taught secondary education. I taught middle school. I didn't ever teach elementary education and I was worried about teaching her how to read and write. Um, but, but I did, and now she can read, she can write, she's doing math. She's seven now and she's doing remarkably well. But I, I think about her, um, and I, I feel like if she was back in the school system, it, she's my only child who's never gone to public school other than preschool. And I thank God that I pulled her when I did, because I, I, I firmly believe that it would have destroyed her. It would have sucked the joy and the life out of this child. She is doing so well. Granted, she did have a meltdown this morning about her pants and the feeling of her pants, which we, I held her and loved on her and just held her. And I said, I know right now the rest of your clothes are in the washing machine. <laughs> so we'll just have to wait. And then you could put on some stretch pants, right? Cause that, that, that against her skin still bothers her, but, but she has the freedom during the day kind of to do it. You know, if she's hungry, she gets something to eat. If she's, which I have snacks all the time for them to have. Uh, if she's tired of learning, she'll tell me, she's like, my brain hurts. I don't spend more than about seven minutes on a subject unless she asks for it. Right now we're reading a book called The Time Traveler. And it's like this, it's a little history book and it has all these pictures. And so we're just going through it through a sporn or now paper pie. And she asks me, like she could listen to that for 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, And so there's some things that she can handle more of than other things. Right. Um, now my son with ADHD and and I'm going to get into some other stories and some research and stuff, but I want to share with you where I come from perspective wise as a parent, as a mother, because I know some of you are dealing with these things, uh, with my second child who is now an adult and he is, has become just a remarkable, remarkable man. Um, he helps me a lot with, um, all of, all of school to homeschool. And we even sent him in high school to, to a specialized school for kids with ADHD, um, that our district had. But even then I still feel like, you know, they did their best to accommodate 
all these these students, but it still fell short. But with him, he started medications. We put him on medications. Uh, it was probably like fourth grade, fourth or fifth grade. And he would say to me every day, he'd say, mom, I can't, the medications, I feel like I'm, I'm in molasses all the time. Like I'm really in slow motion and it hurts my stomach and he was losing weight and he was already a really slender kid. So we went back to the pediatrician and they said, well, let's try a different medication. So we tried a different medication. It was the same thing. He's like, and he would cry. And it got to the point that, that he would cry for me to give him medication. And we tried the extended release and we were spending all this money on these medications and the insurance covered only so much. And he would cry and cry and cry and be like, I feel like my brain is in slow motion all the time. And I, I, there's just something wrong with me. And, and I was taking the advice of the professionals who were well intending. Right. Um, and finally it was like eighth grade roughly eighth grade-ish. I'm trying to remember the exact years. Um, he said, I can't do it anymore. I'm not doing it. I'm not taking these medications anymore. I know they helped me focus. And the teachers were like, oh, now he's really focused, but his executive functioning is still off and he still forgets to turn stuff in. And, and that was the point that I went, it was like towards the end of eighth grade. I'm like, I think we're done. And he stopped taking medications. And, and then the teachers are like, he's all over the place. But the interesting thing is we put him into football because he's obsessed with the, the superpower of kids with ADHD is they get hyper focused on certain subjects. And can I just tell you, it usually is not school subjects that are in traditional schooling. He was hyper focused. We went from being hyper focused on Legos to hyper focused on magic cards to hyper focused on like magic, you know, like doing like magic tricks to hyper focused back to magic cards to hyper focused on football. So I started having him play football. And in the state of Colorado, if the child is homeschooled or goes to like a charter school that does not have a, a, t- a a sports team, or if they, they go to an alternative school that doesn't have a sports team, they, they are allowed to play with the, the home school that they would go to their neighborhood school. So he started playing football and practicing three hours a day. And then he would go to weight training on top of that. And so he's getting an obscene amount of exercise and actually a normal amount of exercise that a child with him, Jordan Peterson, for the, Dr. Peterson said that really boys need to exercise to the point of exhaustion, right? That's what their bodies physically need. If you have a child with ADHD, they need to be working to the point of exhaustion that they're exercising. They're that active to the point of exhaustion. So with the football, he would come home and crash and then just sleep and sleep hard. And then he'd wake up and we didn't have as many problems at school. It was better than when he was on medication. So that Simpson clip where at the end, they're like, the only thing better than this is exercise, right? But most people don't get enough exercise. We live in a nation full of obese people. And I'm saying this as somebody that's very overweight, that's working really hard to lose weight and exercising daily. And, you know, and, and I'm working on it, by the way, I've lost two pounds this week. Thanks. Yay. Yay me. Um, but it's, it's true. And I've gotten in arguments on Facebook about this with people who are like, I am an adult and I need medication. And and there are times that absolutely people do need medications for their neurodiversity, right? I'm not going to argue with that. There are times that that's true, but I think that's the exception and not the rule. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a doctor. I am a mom who has experienced this firsthand, but what I have observed is here the specialist said, your child is the poster child for ADHD. And yet what did he need the most of? Exercise. That's what he needed was exercise. And, um, but the interesting thing is like 
as adults in the United States, we are not getting enough exercise. Our kids are not getting enough exercise and the school system takes away recesses. And that's one thing with my son that they kept doing is if he didn't turn in his work or if he was too um, rambunctious, they would take away his recesses, which is exactly what he needed. And now they try to make accommodations for that. And again, we're going to talk about accommodations here in a second. Um, but they don't, they don't get enough exercise in the schools. And so I think it's interesting because here we are and we consider it this phenomenon, like all these boys are being diagnosed with ADD and ADHD, but we tell them to shut up, sit down for eight hours listen, like you're going to be told a bunch of information for eight hours. We're going to give you a 30 minute lunch, a 15 minute recess. And if you're not going to, Oh, you're wild now. Okay. You know what? Shut up, sit down. Let's medicate you into submission until you do what you're told. So I've become a little bit passionate about this. Again, there are situations where boy, where children need medication, but I think a lot of times we just, we do not get enough exercise and our school system certainly, you know, dressing out for PE for 20 minutes is, is not enough exercise for what our, our children or, or we need for that matter. Um, this is from Dr. Peter Gray says this, he says the kids who can't adapt to school's tedium are diagnosed with ADHD and are, and are put on powerful psychoactive drugs, which have the immediate effect of reducing their spontaneity so they can attend to the teacher and complete the senseless busy work. Nobody knows the long-term effects of these drugs on the human brain, but research with animals suggests that one may affect one effect may be to interfere with the normal development of the brain connections that lead children generally to become more controlled, less impulsive with age and maturity. Perhaps that helps to explain why today we see more and more cases of ADHD extending into adulthood. As with lots of psychoactive drugs, these drugs used to treat ADHD may be creating long-term dependency. This is from... Peter Gray, free to learn why unleashing the instinct to play will make our children happier, more self-reliant, and better students for life. Okay. So uh, I was speaking with, um, we have a specialized, we have this thing called Kilroy's Workshop in Colorado Springs. And it, it if you've seen Forged in Fire on the History Channel where they make, you know, axes and blades and it's a reality competition. Um, many of their winners come from the Kilroy's workshop campus here in Colorado Springs. And I had a, a discussion and actually like to have him on the program. I, I still need to contact him and see if he'd be willing to be on the podcast. But Ron, the founder of Kilroy's said, you know, it's really interesting to me because I have thousands of students come through my workshop a year thousands. He goes, we have thousands now. We've been doing this 10 years and they bladesmith, they blacksmith. Um, they are working with, with heat. That's, you know, a thousand degrees. They're forging, um, kids and they're as young as nine years old. And so he said, you know, it's interesting to me because of the thousands of kids, I always tell parents, my, the parents will say my child has ADHD and, and inevitably I say, don't let them be on medications while they're in the workshop. If there is a problem, we will contact you. And he said, of the thousands of kids that have come through our workshop, only one has, have we had to call the parents and say, yeah, go ahead and bring the medication. He said, it's really interesting because if you give these kids a reason to focus, such as you're working with really hot heat and they're, they're working on creating something really amazing there's no, there's no focus issues. Right. And, and he's like only once, only one time have we had to have a, a, a family bring the medication for the child. So, so it's interesting to me. Um, I want to talk about Thomas Edison for half a second. Okay. This is from the foundation for economic education. It says in 1854, Reverend G. B. Engel belittled one of his students, seven-year-old Thomas Alva Edison, as adult. This outraged the youngster, and he stormed out of the Port Huron, Michigan school, the first formal school he had ever attended. 
His mother, Nancy Edison, brought him back the next day to discuss the situation with Rev- Reverend Engel, but she became angry at his rigid ways. Everything was forced on the kids. She withdrew her son from the school where he had been for only three months and resolved to educate him at home. Although he seems to have briefly attended two more schools, nearly all his childhood learning took, all his childhood learning took place at home. Thus arose the legend that Th- Thomas Alva Edison, born February 11th, 1847, became America's most prolific inventor. 1,093 patents for such wonders as the microphone, the telephone receiver, the stock ticker, the phonograph, movies, office copiers, and incandescent electric light, despite his lacking of school. For years, he looked the part of the improbable homespun genius, five foot, 10 inches tall, gray eyes, long hair that looked as if he cut it himself, baggy acid stained pants, scruffy shoes, and hands discolored by the chemicals. Later, he took to wearing city clothes, black. On more than one occasion, passerbys mistook him for a priest and respectfully tipped their hats. Yet Edison gained Yet Edison probably gained a far better education than most children of his time or ours. This wasn't because his mother had official credentials. She had taught school, but only a little. Nor was it because his parents had money. They were poor and lived on the outskirts of a declining town. Nancy Edison's secret? She was more dedicated than any teacher was likely to be, and she had the flexibility to experiment with various ways of to, of nurturing her son's love for learning. Okay, um, and, it, and the, the article goes on. So, and then we have a doctor, sorry, uh, John Taylor Gatto, who says, and I think this is, this is important. And then let's talk about IEPs in schools and near, uh, two, two twice educate, uh, twice exceptional kids. John Taylor Gatto says, quote, no public school in the United States is set up to allow another George Washington to happen. Washington's in the bud stage are screened, browbeaten or bribed to conform to a narrow outlook on social truth. Boys like Andrew Carnegie, who begged his mother not to send him to school and was well on his way to immortality and fortune at the age of 13, would be referred to today for psychological counseling. Thomas Edison would find himself in special education until his peculiar genius had been sufficiently tamed, unquote. It's John Taylor Gatto, 30-year veteran teacher, New York City Teacher of the Year twice, New York State Teacher of the Year, author of Dumbing Us Down, Weapons of Mass Instruction, and other other books. Okay, so here we have um, these students who are put into the system and, and then they're drugged in the system uh, so that they can be submissive to the system. And yet what psychologically happens to a lot of these kids, a lot of these neurodivergent kids, they start to believe that they are stupid. Uh, I recently saw a little Instagram short and it was the friend of um, the JetBlue founder. And he said, you know, it's interesting. And I'm going to paraphrase this horribly. I was trying to find the clip earlier today, but I couldn't find it. He said, you know, it's interesting because the, the founder of JetBlue also was the inventor of the e-ticket, right? That was that was his brainchild as e-tickets. I just flew back from our conference a few days ago. I used an e-ticket, right? This was his. When JetBlue went public, he said, I was in the car with him when it went, when JetBlue went public. And in the matter of minutes, he was a, worth millions, right? Because like it just, it just took fire. He said, what was interesting was I made a comment to him about like, wow, look at this, you know, you've made millions. And he, and, and the, the, the jet blue founder said, and yet I still feel like that stupid kid in school that will amount to nothing, right? One of the long-term effects that our education system has on these neurodivergent kids is that these children grow up believing that they're stupid, that they're dumb, that they can't follow rules, that there's something wrong with them. Um, even this morning, my, my seven-year-old, I held her, you know, as she was starting to have a meltdown and, and I'm able to calm her meltdowns now by just holding her and rocking her back and forth. And, and I said, baby, and she's like, it's my sensory. And I said, I know. I said, but your sensory is kind of your superpower. 
And she said, but I'm not weird. And I said, no, you're not weird. She goes, are other kids sensory? And I said, yes, their other kids have sensory issues too. And I said, but it's kind of your superpower because now you can feel when things are extra soft, can't you? You know, and we talked through it and she got a big smile. And I said, you are, you are remarkable, which is awesome. Um, my, my now adult son is like, I feel like my whole life, I, I, I believe that my ADHD was a hindrance. He goes, mom, now I believe it's a superpower. And I said, it absolutely is a superpower. His brain goes so fast, but he's able to, to focus on things that I struggle focusing on. Right. And, and he does remarkable things. Um, so I want to talk about what do they do in the public schools? And, and here you are homeschooling your kids. And many of you, some of you are like, I need respite with my child who has autism, or I need respite with my child who has ADHD. If that is the case, right? My suggestion is, and you want to, and you're thinking about homeschooling and you have the means to do it. Um, and you might have to make sacrifices to do it. I know one family who the dad took on two jobs so that they could homeschool their kids. They had to make sacrifices. Um, but if that's the case, my suggestion is finding a, an enrichment program. A lot of states have enrichment programs where the child can go one or two days a week. And it, with enrichment programs, they're not graded. Uh, they're not given homework. Um, and there's all sorts of different enrichment programs that, that many states will pay for one to two days a week, depending on the state. Let your child go to an enrichment program so that you can have respite from that child for a little bit and that you as a mom can regroup and, and be able to, um, have a little bit of time so that then you can meet the needs of that child in the future. I've heard that from moms over and over and over. What do I do when I need respite? Well, that's what you do. Um, if you can find an enrichment program, if you can get them into programs where, Maybe they need to be in, in football or something that allows their bodies to get more exercise. But the, those are some simple options. I know that's kind of an oversimplification of things, but, but I look at my neurodivergent child and we do two enrichment programs for her. We do one through the school district and one that we pay out of pocket for, which is a forest school, which allows her to be outside and she loves being outdoors and she loves them. And then we do the homeschooling the rest of the three days. But that allows me to regroup and prepare for the, the needs that she has. Now, in the school system, because many moms who are pulling their kids are like, yeah, but what about their IEP? What about their 504? You know, because right now my child has an IEP. They have a 504. And, and what do I do to homeschool them? what do I do about the IEP and 504? Um, my friends, do you know what they do in the school system for children with IEPs, also called individual education plans, which my 16 year old yesterday said, I think every child deserves an individual education plan. We're all different. I'm like, I know son, I agree. However, the school system does not private and public. It doesn't matter. They don't have the resources to really truly meet the needs of the children. They don't. When you have one teacher teaching 30 kids in elementary school or a high school teacher or middle school teacher who has 150 kids a day and they're expected to meet the accommodations of all of their different neurodivergent students, I'm telling you, people and kids fall through the cracks every day. Day. But let's talk about what generally is used for IEPs. Okay. Here we go. We're going to start. This is, again, this is from the Child Mind Institute. This is what they su suggest. You can also prevent behavioral problems by adding supports that will benefit neurotypical and neurodivergent students. These additions include things like visual supports. Uh, for example, Having the day's schedule clearly posted where all the students can see it. Okay, you can do that at home too. Starting the day with breathing relaxation exercise to ground the children or ground the kids. Yeah, you can do that at home. Having a relaxation area in the classroom where kids can put on noise cancellation headphones when they get overwhelmed. Or you can have a couch at home and since they're not sitting at a desk, they don't really have to worry about that. Having a safe person who the child knows they can go to. 
when they feel overwhelmed, angry, or upset. Or it's called you as a mother when you can hold them and hug them, which teachers cannot do, right? They can't do that. It can be you and you can love on them and hug them and say, it's going to be okay. Let's take a break. Scheduling movement breaks since it can be hard for neurodivergent kids to sit through long periods. Yeah, no kidding, Sherlock. Um, Kids were not meant to sit for eight hours a day. At homeschooling, we can do it for seven minutes and then take a nice long break outside for an hour. Here we go. Preferential seating. Seating for neurodivergent kids, like having kids with learning issues sit closer to the, quote, action where teaching is happening, pairing them with kids who are good behavioral models and will be less distracting. Or having them next to you, the whole, like, while they're learning or when they have questions, where you can answer their questions or be close to them when they have questions. Yeah, I can do that at home. Providing things like wiggle seats, nubbed cushions designed to help neurodivergent kids who focus better when they can move around in their seats. Or how about not having them in seats at all at home? How about having them on the floor or doing their work upside down on the stairs, laying down the stairs? Yes, that happened once right? She's laying down on the stairs, wiggling around, and then she gets up and moves, right? Keeps going. Supports for executive functioning skills. Checklists for everything from morning routine to what goes into your kids' backpacks every day. Or they don't have a backpack. That's another option. Dedicated binders for each subject. You can do that at home. Reward systems like a sticker chart for younger kids. Also, you can do that at home. Using timers so kids have visual reference for each task they need to complete. Also, you can do that at home. Planner and calendars for kids to keep track of short-term and long-term projects. We have a calendar that my seven-year-old refers to every day. She kind of thinks it's cute too. Online planners to back up paper ones. Or they don't need planners at all. Okay. So that's uh, from a psychologist as suggestions for the school system. Okay. Okay. This is from the Pennsylvania Department of Education. These are, I printed out the accommodations for children with ADD. Have clear expectations, give short, concise directions, and establish routines uh, that stays the same. Okay, as a mom, you can create routines for those kids. Allow the student to take 15 to 20 minute brain breaks. Okay, my friends, that's not happening in the public school classroom. It's not. The teachers have to get through a lot of, information that they are expected to teach. That's not happening, but you can do it at home without a problem. Establish a nonverbal cue between teacher and student. By the way, this is the 504 and individual education plan accommodation suggestions. Engage the student's passions and provide a hook when teaching a lesson. Okay. Or you can just totally hundred percent focus on their passions. Just saying. And by the way, how many teachers can really focus on 30 students' passions, or again, if they're middle or high school, 150 students' passions. Not going to happen. Not No matter how hard they try, they are one person. But if it's just you and your child or your three kids or your five kids, that's doable. You can do that at home. Positively reinforce reinforce appropriate behavior. Allow the student to run errands or stand at times while working. Or how about letting them just sleep on the floor, like work on the on the floor? My daughter's favorite place to work is on the carpet. Um, allow the student. I uh, see. Sit the student away from distractions. Okay, you could do that at home too. Provide peer assistance and note taking, and ask students questions to encourage participation in discussion. Or they don't really need to take notes when they're at home because they're being privately tutored by you. Okay. And it goes on and on and on. Uh, Provide a time for the students to release their energy and move around to socialize. My point is all of the accommodations they suggest for the individual education plan and for the 504 accommodations for students, you naturally already do at home. You already do them at home. Do you hear me? Do you, are you hearing what I'm saying? If your child has an IEP at school, you naturally already do that as a parent at home. My friends, the accommodations, like these kids, 
bring them home and watch them blossom. Bring them home and watch them blossom. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I, I have a child with sensory processing disorder. By the way, we have very few meltdowns anymore. After we went to the Star Institute, then she graduated, right? She had the occupational therapy and, and it was great, which the school, by the way, didn't didn't provide, even though they were going to have accommodations for her and a 504 for her, uh, the occupational therapy was not going to be included in, in that we had to pay out of pocket for that, but they're better off having me at home as a private tutor, even with all of my deficiencies than they are in a public or private school with 30 kids and one teacher expecting to accommodate all of them they're better off at home. Okay. Now some of you are like, yeah, but my child receives speech, um, therapy, or they receive occupational therapy at school. Okay. So I want to address this. We actually, um, one of the interviews that I have scheduled is a professional occupational therapist who has worked in the schools and who works with homeschooling parents. She's going to come and talk with us. Um, I'm very excited to have her phenomenal woman phenomenal ideas. And, and we're going to have her on the program to discuss what you can do, um, as a mom, if you don't have the occupational therapy as a resource. Okay. So this is what she said. She's like, honestly, the occupational therapy, I know it's it, it, a lot of, she goes, I worked with kids, right. Uh, in the school system, she goes, they get so little time. Like they just get a lick of occupational therapy, just a little bit. I spoke with a speech language pathologist two weeks ago who worked in the schools and then worked exclusively in the private sector. And this is what she told me. She said, oh, in the schools, they, they have, uh, the requirement for, for many kids to part of their accommodations or their IEP is to have speech therapy. She said, but the truth is, and most speech therapists don't like to work in the schools because they pull the kids out. You pull them out for 30 minutes at a time, but it's usually five to six kids at a time. You have to do it by group and really, and then we'd work with them individually for like five minutes and they weren't getting what they really needed, but the schools don't have the resources. And a lot of speech language pathologists don't want to work in the schools because they're not able to really help the kids the way that they need to help the kids. She goes, which is why I went, ended up going to the private sector because I will get 30 minutes with one child at a time. And if they get the full 30 minutes with the speech language pathologist when insurance uh, allows it, or if, you know, those who have government assistance, uh, they're able to, to get that service. So that's an option for you, by the way, budgeting is a problem. Money is an issue. If you are on government assistance and you are homeschooling, um, you do have in many States, there's that option for, um, for specialized services like occupational therapy, like speech language pathology, having a speech pathologist come in and and work with your child. Okay. Uh, Otherwise you may pay out of pocket, but you can also look at insurance and see what insurance will cover and what, what it would take to cover some of those services. But what my point is what they're getting in the school is not that great because as I've talked to all these professionals, they're only able to spend a few minutes with each child, which is not having much of an effect. It's not. But having you work one-on-one with them is going to have far more of an effect than being in a classroom with 30 other students and being pulled out once a week for five, you know, 30 minutes, but you're only getting five minutes with a specialist. Okay. So as a mom, you can accommodate those kids with your, with, with, what they would do in the schools, you already are naturally doing at home with homeschooling. You're already, na- you're doing it moms. You're already doing it. You're already accommodating those kids. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about twice exceptional kids. Um, this is, I met the most delightful homeschooling mom who coaches, um, entrepreneurial moms. And she and I, met at this conference and she told me about this. It's the Temple, Templeton National Report, Report on Acceleration. The report is called A Nation Deceived, How Schools Hold Back America's Brightest Students. This is volume one. Um, this was put together by a series of teachers and administrators who felt like um, 
twice exceptional kids were falling through the cracks. Now, a lot of times with twice exceptional kids, they end up being behavioral problems and things. Uh, they're, they're very gifted, but they end up being behavioral problems. And a lot of times they have other things like autism or ADHD on top of being twice exceptional, meaning that they have these brilliant brains. Now I see often on Facebook groups, especially in, I'm in a kindergarten Facebook group, which is funny because my daughter's not in kindergarten anymore, but I'm in the group and regularly somebody posts like my child wants to read ahead but I want to keep them at grave level. What should I do? And I'm like, are you an idiot? No, I don't say that. But I think that I'm like, mom, listen to your child. Like they want to read ahead, right? Most kids, and I preach this. I'm like, developmentally, like you meet your child where they are. Most kids developmentally really don't need to really start to learn, want to learn to read till they're roughly seven, eight, nine years old, right? But then occasionally you're going to get these twice exceptional kids, these two E kids, who at the age of three are reading cereal boxes and you're like, what the heck happened? Like how? And those kids, you meet them where they're at and you give them what they need. If they want to learn more, you give them the opportunity for learning more, right? Don't hold them back. Don't make them do a first grade curriculum if they're ready for a fourth grade curriculum or don't give them a curriculum at all, right? Do what Thomas Edison's mom did and unschool. That's what we do too. Okay. So this is from A Nation Deceived, How Schools Hold America's Brightest Students Back. And this is, they wrote this report in hopes to help schools accommodate these brilliant children. Okay. These savant children. This is how it starts. Mom and dad are the ones who usually notice first. He's reading the shampoo bottle, one mother said of a three-year-old. But, uh, but then parents discover a more surprising truth in most school districts, a four-year-old who reads fluently, who is already counting and who is socially mature and ready to leave his parents for the day is typically prohibited from starting school. Huh. Imagine that because you know why they want to keep you in a box. That's unfortunate. Research shows that parents are good judges of whether or not their children have advanced skills. I'm quoting this by the way. They also know when their children are socially ready for school. Parents also have a vested interest in figuring out what their children are capable of so they can have the programs they need. An efficient and effective way to let children with advanced skills reach their potential is to let them start school early. According to the most recent state of the state's Gifted and Talented Education Report, many states do not have explicit policies about early entrance to school. The lack of clear guidelines for schools is the first problem facing a four-year-old who reads, loves to learn, and wants to learn more. But even when there is no administrative barrier, many school districts frown on accepting children who are younger than five into school. Okay, this is like an 85-page report. It goes on and on and on about talking about why... Twice exceptional kids should be allowed to jump grades because they're emotionally far more able to do so. They're held back. They become behavioral problems. They put them in the box. Okay. It goes on. The, I mean, it's a long report. It is. And and they talk about these are all these different things you could do for these kill, kids. Okay. I'm going to read. It says America. This is chapter one. America ignores excellence. And America Is America ignoring excellence? Newspaper headlines proclaim that our nation's schools are producing weak students who lag behind age peers in other countries. Meanwhile, there's a quieter story that's been kept in the dark, but is just as important to our country's future. In every state, in every school, in huge cities, in tiny farm communities, students are ready for much for much more challenge than the system provides. These students perform better than any politician dares to expect. They are the top scorers, the ones who break the curve. They're the kids who read shampoo bottles at age three and read newspaper newspaper editorials at age five. They can add up the cost of groceries faster than the cashier, than a cash register. They shock their parents and wow their grandparents. But when they enter school, things change. Okay, again, this report is being put together by teachers, administrations, psychologists, specialists have put this report together. Okay. They are the ones saying this, not me. This is not coming from me again, but when they enter, this is quote, 
when they enter school, things change. They're often the most frustrated students in the classroom. They're bored in kindergarten and they're bored again in first grade. Year after year, they learn little that they haven't learned already. They hope things will get better, but things rarely do. For many of them, nothing changes. America's school system keeps bright students in line by forcing them to learn in a lockstep manner with their classmates. Teachers and principals disregard students' desires to learn more and uh, much more than they are being taught. Instead of praise and encouragement, these students hear one word, no. When they ask for a challenge, they are held back. They want to fly. They are told to stay in their seats, stay in your grade, know your place. They go on to say it's a national scandal and the price may be the slow but steady erosion of American excellence, unquote. The report goes on to suggest to school administrators to allow twice uh, to each children, twice exceptional children, to move ahead in grades, to let them do concurrent enrollment, to let them go to college early, to let them graduate early, to let them do these things early, right? This is their plea in this report. This is their plea in this report. Never once does it mention, or you could homeschool and then the administration doesn't even need to worry about it because these kids' parents are on top of it. I had two kids start college last year. My daughter was 14 years old. By the way, she has not been labeled as twice exceptional, even though she is exceptional. Okay. My son, 15 years old, started college. We did, we ended up going the concurrent enrollment route. So the state would pay for it. And I didn't have to pay out of pocket. And my daughter ended up on the Dean's list by the end of the year. She took, they took uh, English Composition 1, English Composition 2. They took public speaking. She took children's literature. My son took business classes. Um, He ended, my son ended up on the president's list. He had above a 4.0. My daughter had a 4.0. He had above a 4.0. My son is twice exceptional, okay? They were 14 and 15 years old. By the way, what happened at the end of the year? Both asked me if they could please drop out because they felt like it was a waste of their time. (sighs) I created this, right? And I did. I didn't make them go back this year. Um, My son is pursuing his dreams right now and spends eight hours a day in Premiere Pro uh, on the Adobe Creative Cloud editing and things like that. Last Monday, he popped into a public school to uh, to go to a calculus class just for fun. By the way, the school didn't stop him. It was a public school, a different one from last time. Remember, I think in a last, another episode, I told you that one day he decided to go to school for a day. So he went with his friend. They didn't kick him out either. He went the whole day and came home and said, oh my gosh, all they do is tell you what to do. I cannot believe these poor kids. I'm so glad you, you pulled me out. He came back this last Monday and said, oh mom, the class was so boring. These kids have no time to discover what they're good at or what they like. I feel so sorry for all of the public school kids. I feel so sorry for them, right? Um, here, this whole article, this whole research paper, this whole report is trying to convince school districts to allow twice exceptional kids to move forward but the schools won't allow it, right? It's still a battle for them. It's still a battle. Some schools try to accommodate. Um, My son's friend goes to a different school for math, right? But, But really the accommodations are still lacking. They also talk about letting them do advanced placement, which my issue with advanced placement is like, well, why don't you just have them go to college and just get the credit as opposed to AP classes where you may or may not get credit for the class, right? I didn't. I took three AP classes. Then you have to take the test. Then you have to prove these things. And I ended up getting no college credit for the class. Whereas had I just gone to college as a 14 or 15 year old, I would have done fine. And by the way, I was really concerned for my kids going to college, like what kind of peer pressure would there be? Let me tell you something. College students do not want to have a lot of interaction with high school kids. They don't, right? They're like, okay, they're 14 and 15. I don't really want to hang out with them. 
They never saw drug use while they were there. No one wants to approach an underage minor about drugs in a community college or a state college. They don't. I thought that they would. I was surprised. My kids are like, oh, yeah, no. Wait, everyone's been really, really nice to us. They don't. My son does hang out with a couple of students that he met at the state college, but they were also in his situation where they were 17 and homeschooled and started early, right? So um, so I was worried about that. I was worried about peer pressure in college. And my son was like, oh, mom, stuff was way worse in public school, like the peer pressure, drugs, all of that. Yeah, no, not at the, not at, not at the college level. They didn't, it wasn't like people didn't want to interact with a 14 and 15 year old, just in case you're worried about that. Like, oh my gosh, what if, what if they're approached by, about drugs? My kids were not because, you know, a 50 year old adult that's a non-traditional student just doesn't want to talk to a 14 year old. And, and most of those people are not on drugs, right? I'm sure that there were some kids, but that was my one concern socially. And they got along great with their peers. And they, they had one student in their class that was my age, you know, and, and I'm 46, right? Um, my point is anyway, don't let that peer pressure of college worry you for your high school kids as a homeschool mom, as a homeschool dad, you can push them as need as much as they need to be pushed. You can also slow down as much as they need to be slowed down. You provide the accommodations because it's you and your kids. And as they mentioned in this report, yeah, you are more invested than the schools. Thank you teachers for acknowledging that for crying out in the crying in a bucket. Our, our own secretary of education brought up how parents had just recently, like two weeks ago, have no, no right to, to complain to school boards, right? The teachers union said that nobody cares more than teachers about a child's education. Well, with all due respect, bull crap, the parents do. You do. You are invested in your child's education because you're the parent, because you're raising that baby, because it matters to you. Whether they succeed or not matters to you because you love them more than anybody else does. So takeaway today to wrap up parents, you can provide the accommodations that your kids need. You can do it. You can push them ahead when they need to. You can hold them back where they need to. You can give them the space when they need to. You can provide the accommodations that the really realistically the, the schools cannot. They can't. And you'll do a better job. So with that, go do marvelous things. I'm excited for you to hear the interview next week. Go do marvelous things. Go love on your kids. You got this, mamas. Thank you so much for listening. And if you like this podcast, please be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter at schooltohomeschool.com. That's school, T-O, homeschool.com. Join our private Facebook group, School to Homeschool, and follow me on Instagram, Janae.Daniels.